All right, joining us for this special episode, I'm very pleased to have a frequent guest who, if you're subscribed to the channel, you, you certainly know who he is, Hoser Miller, who is the author of Raven One series and the fictional history of the Battle of Midway called The Silver Waterfall, as well as the guy who helped design a DCS campaign that's based on the Raven One series. Please welcome again to the channel, Hoser Miller. Hoser, how are you? Hi, Moose. Great to be with you again. Thanks. And then our first time guest, and if you're a fan of the F-14, he should not be a stranger to you, is my good friend, Crunch Snyder, Tomcat pilot extraordinaire who's flown basically every type model series uh, that the airplane has. Also a Top Gun guy. If you haven't seen the Tomcast, he and Bio both host the Tomcast. Uh, they had season one and now they're in the middle of season two. If you like the Tomcat, you've absolutely got to check out the Tomcast. So uh, we last saw, in fact, Hoser and I were, were doing um, our uh, booth together at the air show at Oceania. We saw uh, actually Crunch in real life there. It was fantastic to see you. So good to we see have you. Done this. We should have done this episode that day. We, we could we have, have, right? Except I think that day it was windy as hell. Right, it was like thirty knots, steady, and every episode I did, and I only did one that day because the other others were unlistenable because yeah. of the wind. Even with like dual, um, you know, uh, wind things or whatever, it, it was it was really uh, windy. Uh, day two, the Saturday was gorgeous, um, but in any case, it, it's great to see you, Crunch. And uh, let me just say, when we're talking Desert Fox, both these guys were there for this contingency operation, for this four-day war. So let me first start with kind of a, a scene setter. After Saddam invaded Kuwait in the fall of 1990, the Bush 41 administration mustered a coalition of military forces to push him back into Iraq. That operation, known as Desert Storm, started in February of 91. It was complete about 100 days later. But in spite of what some American officials predicted, that didn't remove Saddam from power in Iraq. And the belief that he was developing weapons of mass destruction led to a series of UN resolutions and the establishment of two no-fly zones known as Operation Northern Watch and Operation Southern Watch. Northern Watch sorties were flown mostly out of Incirlik Air Base in Turkey, and Southern Watch sorties were flown from bases in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf. Part of that UN resolution was also inspection of suspected WMD sites, and the Iraqis' hesitance or outright refusal to allow inspectors access to some of those sites fueled the West's perception that Saddam posed a threat, and that ramped up the tension. So I flew Southern Watch sorties in 95 and 96 when I was in VF-102 aboard USS America, and again in 97 and 98 when I was the Air Wing 1 operations officer aboard the USS George Washington. During that deployment, tensions were high between the U.S. and Iraq, and occasionally Iraqi SAMs would fire at airplanes patrolling the no-fly zones, but they never hit any of them, primarily because of the reaction of our jammy aircraft, the Prowler. As a result of this activity, the U.S., under the direction of President Bill Clinton, who was also dealing at the same time with the fallout of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, added two other aircraft carriers to our presence in the Gulf, Nimitz and Independence. And we were ordered to develop a strike plan that eliminated any threat that Saddam posed to coalition aircraft. And several times we got word that we should get ready to execute that plan. But before we could, we were relieved by the USS John C. Stennis, who was relieved in turn a couple of months later by the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, who also came very close to executing those strikes. Then Ike was relieved four months later by you guys aboard the USS Enterprise. So Enterprise gets to the AOR and set the scene. Yeah, Mooch, uh, November 1998, uh, we, we uh, set out on our deployment and we went right there. We didn't stop. I mean, tensions were high. Uh, we needed to uh, relieve Ike uh, on station. And so uh, we got to the, to the, to the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf, Arabian Gulf, if you will, uh, roughly uh, November, uh, around Thanksgiving, of 1998, around that time, and, and started flying right away. We did a turnover with uh, the guys on on Ike, and uh, uh, and and they gave us uh, their folders. Uh, I got uh, a folder from uh, former squadron mate 
Uh, he was the CEO of the Rampagers at the time, Pat Rainey. And uh, uh, Bullet Miller was also in, in that air wing. And uh, so we all we all caught up. But then uh, we, we, we took their folders. So we just kind of set them aside and we would fly uh, OSW patrols, uh, familiarizations, if you will, uh, over southern Iraq from the end of November through the first half of December 98. So when you say f- folder, that that's a strike folder, right? That's that's you're just sort of this is the, the the homework of the guys before they just sort of hand over the the, the work that has been done. Correct. Crunch, you're in VF thirty two, the swordsman. This is noteworthy in that the the Tomcat at that time was now had the lantern pod. Talk to us a little bit about that capability. This was my second deployment, so I was a young uh, lieutenant. And you know, Hoser, skipper of 105 at the time, on your what fifth, sixth deployment, probably. I'm on my second. I'm uh, I've done one full deployment, a full workup. So I'm now a section lead, division lead, not a strike lead. I'm a forward air controller, airborne, and doing doing pretty well. I'm also you know an LSO doing that type of stuff at the time. As I showed up in the squadron back in 96, right? So two years prior, we were just starting to get these things called lantern pods. And they were like gold and and they would be transferred. Like there were four of them and they would go from one squadron to the other and and go off on deployment and things like that. It was just when we got, we were on this deployment now in 98, we were starting to see more of them. We had enough lantern pods to put one on every airplane on the flight deck. And maybe a spare or two. I, I don't remember. So everybody had these lantern pods, and they were absolutely amazing because we had uh, they had their own GPS antenna. They had incredibly great visuals. You could get really good imagery, so that whether you're doing battle damage assessment, battle hit assessment, uh, trying to find the target, employ on a difficult target, maybe like a bunker or a command shelter or something like that. It was. Uh, it was really good. So in comparison, the the Hornets in our air wing had the Nighthawk pod, which was, it, it you know, great at, great when it was fielded. It was not as good as what we had in the Lantern. And so we actually were now up on step and the Tomcat was able to employ with the Lantern pod. It was actually the Lantern targeting pod because uh, the F-15 Strike Eagle had two pods, a navigation pod and the targeting pod. We had just the targeting pod. And what we were able to do is employ laser-guided bombs with that. So you would, uh, you know, just to keep the folks up to speed, you know, you, and on the bomb, it would be coded to a certain laser code frequency, and you could dial in a certain, that same co- frequency code into the lantern pod. And when you laser the target, the reflection of that energy, the bomb seeker would see it, and it would home in on that and as as long as you dropped it fast enough, there was enough energy. It would go through the air, and the the basically the guidance kit would direct those fins. They'd be flapping all over the place to get it to to hit the target. And as long as you you gave it a good profile and enough energy, it would hit the target. And so we were able to employ GBU tens, twelves, and sixteens, uh, which were two thousand five hundred and thousand pounders in that order. And also we had GBU twenty fours. And so the GBU twenty four actually did a different profile instead of just dropping it and dropping it into a uh, you know basically in a free fall and, and hitting a target. It actually like would do this loft thing and it could do a whole bunch of different profiles. And it was really good for going into hardened targets. So it was it was a bunker buster. I don't think it's overselling to say that it was a game changer. It was it gave us a capability that was new to the theater and it was only comparable in the strike of Eagle in the Air Force. I remember when we did the the war, the Bosnian War uh circa 95 96, we didn't have lantern yet. The Tomcat started dropping dumb bombs. It was a 10 mil dumb bomber. And in fact, the air wing that we relieved in the Adriatic was the, was the Roosevelt. And for some reason, the, the JFAC allowed them to do one dumb bomb mission. And they, they let's just say it wasn't terribly accurate and uh, fortunately didn't kill anybody, uh, you know, unintended. But it kind of uh, dragged a stick of bombs w- well beyond where the target was. Uh, in the course of doing CCIP delivery from the Tomcat. So they said no more dumb bombing with the F-14 during that time frame. And so now, as you mentioned, Crunch, we had a very high resolution display, better than the Nighthawk pod, um, which is somewhat 
ironic because the Hornet guys were pretty obnoxious uh, during the uh, the CAG 1, 95, 96. They literally shut planning doors in our faces during that cruise. The world changed. The other thing that was, let's just say, an advantage, and Hoser, you speak to this in the article you wrote for Hook Magazine about this Operation Desert Fox, was the existence of an F-14 Rio. So the 10 by 10 display was in the back co- cockpit. And so the Rio is the guy aiming the laser spot. Um, and uh, in the Hornet, the pilot had to do both keep the airplane from hitting the ground, look out for AAA, and also aim the pod. So you used you mentioned how you learned how to use autopilot to mitigate the fact it was just one guy. But certainly, I think you would agree um, that it was an advantage to have two guys in the airplane at, in that that particular circumstance. Absolutely, and as a as a as a strike lead, you take a look at the the the, the Dimpy's designated mean point of impact, and uh, okay, there, that the, that's a challenging Dimpy right there. So, uh, so Crunch, get over here. Uh, you know, this this is going to be for for you guys. So we we flew with with VF thirty two, and they flew with all the Hornet squadrons. You know, using the the advantages of, of both airplanes, the, the, the weapon systems, the missiles we carried, the missiles that the, the F-14 carried. Uh, so that was the norm. Another thing that all of us had, and uh, yes, Lantern and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Flair was a game changer, was NBGs. After Desert Storm, very quickly, everyone got NBGs. My squadron had the FA-18C Lot 13 night strike aircraft. And those aircraft got to the fleet late 1990, early 1991. Uh, Sister squadron, VFA-37, is flying the Lot 18, uh, so five years younger and lots more black box coolness. Night vision goggles increase situational awareness. They, they are not a targeting mechanism, but, uh, but you know, having those things on, just it doesn't turn the night into day but it just increases your awareness around you. So it is easier to, to fly formation. It is easier to, to, you know, pick up things, but you're still going to use your system. You're still going to use your, uh, your infrared pod to, uh, to find what you need to aim at. So people who don't understand the details of, of night vision devices, uh, maybe don't understand that it's not just put on the goggles and everything's great. You have to adjust the lighting crunch. If you could describe how we had to mod the Tomcat, because the first time I used NVGs was a monocle where we just turned the lights off. Sure. And we're, me and Kraut Dale looking through these monocles thinking we were badasses. Um, yep. Well, you were badasses for the time, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't as Gucci as we got, you know, by the time we get to Desert Fox. What we had to do is our airplanes were not set up for night vision. So they, uh, you know, for in night vision, a green color is okay. A, a red or a white is going to blossom and it just blinds you. Right. And so for the listeners, you know, anything that is red, a light is going to be a problem. It'll just wash out the cockpit. Well, guess what's red? Every warning and caution light is red and every, everything that comes on, they go, yeah, you might be in the wrong configuration. Let me just give you an indication. And so here we were in the, uh, in the F-14 and, and there was so many lights, even, or a yellow light was bad. And we have this giant display. I mean, it, it was just row after row of row of these caution and warning lights and everything. And they're all the wrong color. And so if you had anything pop up, low fuel light or a stall warning or anything, all of a sudden you're washed out. You can't see a thing and you're better off without them. So what we would do is we would fly with tape. This is what we did. And you would have a roll of tape and uh, sometimes you would just throw it in the pocket of your G suit. But then it, it was easier if you just pre tore little pieces and you would just put them on your helmet and you would have them ready to go almost like a pitcher where you you got a little vaseline on the on the brim it was the same type of thing you'd have a little tape all over your helmet and which of course is a problem because the whole point of the helmet being reflective is that it reflects light if you go in the water and we're covering it all up with tape right so but you would get into the airplane and you would just start pulling the tape off and just covering up all these lights and it was funny because now you had covered up all of your warning and caution lights. It's not like they were completely opaque at this point, but it was pretty, 
pretty bizarre if you think about it that the the, uh, the 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 method we were using was to just tape over all the lights that told us we were having a problem and just like let's just ignore that because it's making making it so that I can't see and we'll figure it out later. The other thing that people might wonder is when did you wear the NVGs? Was it from takeoff to to landing or was it once you got airborne? When did you put those on? We put them on airborne. Uh, so you, you take the take the cat shot with them off, and uh, you, you get airborne. Uh, uh, and typically off the tanker, we would not wear them on the tanker because again, the tanker's got external lights that are, that are going to blind you. So so once you're clear of the tanker, you're with your wingman. Uh, we would say goggle, and then you put them on. Or if you had them on goggle, and that take them off. Uh, so we, we would we would goggle up, and uh, and then you know you know adjust our lights. Uh, coming back to the ship, we would. Uh, we would, you know, get our marshal information, take the goggles off, and we would marshal with them off and, and trap with them off. And people say, well, you know, don't, wouldn't you want them for a trap? And uh, for two reasons, no, you're you're going to get washed out by, you know, the, the ball and and uh, the, the the deck lights. But also, uh, you don't want to eject with those things. So if you're ever in an ejection situation, we would just take them off and, and throw them, you know, down by our feet. Uh, if you eject with them, uh, chances of you breaking your neck. Are high, although it's been done, but uh, but not preferred. So that that was the procedure: just just take them off and throw them down. You don't need them anymore. And it, was that also true for the Tomcat Crunch? Yeah, it was the same same thing. It, of course, we had a little bit of more coordination because we within the cockpit, because um, we would want to be both goggled at the same time. You know, in addition to your wingman, and, and a lot of times you could have a a reflection across the canopy from the back seat or vice versa. And so if, if one person's on the goggles and the other person is up there going, Hey, I dropped my pen and pulls out his flashlight. All of a sudden it, it'll flash the canopy. There was a finite number of NVG apparatuses. And, and mm-hmm. so it, everybody didn't have their own goggles, at least not in a Tomcat squadron. Hoser, I don't know if you guys each had your own. We, we would check out a pair. Okay. But yeah, you had to check them out from the SDO, just like you had to check out a pistol right. or whatever else. Um, and, and so these were controlled items. You had to take care of them, you know, expensive in the case and all this sort of thing. So you had to really treat them with, with care. I remember $40,000, $40,000 each, which is kind of cheap by F-35 standards. Right. But, uh, still that, that's a lot, that's a lot of money. The funny part of it is you said, talk about that case. It was surprisingly large. I mean, if you just looked at it sitting on the, de- on the desk, you think that's nothing. But once you pick that up. You have to find somewhere to put it in the cockpit. You're like, Jesus, now I got another thing. And it's, it feels like it's just taking up all this giant space. I've already got one helmet bag with all my targeting stuff. And now I got this NVG thing and it would be, you know, anybody watching on the video, you know, it's that big and it's filled with foam. So it's all protected. And it's kind of like a cutout toolbox thing and, and you cover it up and sure it's soft sided, but it's bulky. And it, 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 I felt like it was always in my way. And anytime I was pre-flighting, like I felt like I was banging it against the knee knockers going down the P-way or something like that. It was always, to me, it was clunky and, and bulky. Also, you had to be concerned about where it was for the trap and the, and the shot, um, right? Because just having loose gear uh, for either launch or recovery was a, was a bad idea. Um, so what did you guys do to ensure in the Tomcat that it wasn't going to be FOD? I, I just had it jammed back here. It, because it was it was in such a if it uh, when we trapped it was probably going to hit my elbow and if it didn't i was i it, and it went past it meant that i stopped so <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk about cuz Jose, you mentioned the inter, inter deployment training cycle the idtc and for us it generally starts with fallon strike you we would go there long hours they would put us through the ringer. They would change the planet last minute. As you've both mentioned, strike planning uh, is, a, is a real skill that you learn. It's a lot of work. So what did you learn at Fallon that you leveraged when the bubble went up in December of 98? Mooch, for me, I was a squadron XO in 1997 and, uh, and went to Fallon in the initial class of the airborne uh, mission commander course, uh, the strike lead course that they had just stood up for, for guys, you know, for, for strike leads. And, uh, so it was a lot of us squadron XOs would go there. Uh, Top Gun had moved to Fallon by this time. 
So the Top Gun guys are, are living there and, and we're learning from them. And, uh, uh, you know, I remember the initial the initial strike that they handed it to us. OK, here here is your strike. You fly this. It's already planned for you. You, you go ahead and, and make it happen. And then uh, and then you'd come back and and uh, spend uh, three to four hours in, in a debrief. And then then the, the next day you'd, uh, you might spend the day planning. And then the day after that, you're going to fly what a strike that you plan. Um, the uh, th- there's a nine page checklist for a for a strike lead. And, and in those nine pages are, are, are full of, uh, of uh, bullets and, and sub bullets. And you have to have answers for all that stuff. And, and you, you know, you might have, uh, you know, 48 hours, maybe 24 to, to plan something. And so you have to put together a team and you take the expert from the, the 14 squadron. You got a harm expert. You got a weaponeering expert. You got the airborne electronic attack expert from the prowler squadron. All those experts are, uh, are and you give them tasks. You cannot do it yourself. And then uh, the uh, just the, the amount of, uh, of coordination, uh, airborne on, on the radio, and and uh, uh, but but then it gets back to the blocking and tackling. You know, as a section and division, when you go to a place like Key West and you're going to do your fighter web stuff there, and and all that training. Now you're you're drawing back on that. You're you're drawing back on your weapon set training to to deliver the, these weapons. It it all comes together, in in the Super Bowl, if you will. On, on this uh, on a strike of some 20 airplanes. What, what had happened also during this period since Desert Storm was that the training and readiness matrix had, had changed with the advent of the strike fighter tactics instructor concept. And uh, this is a guy that had gone through Top Gun and had all this, not only the air to air, but the air to ground today, air to surface training, and, uh, and comes back to the squadron as, as an expert. Standardization with the Air Force had occurred. You know, it was a kind of a mess in 1991. By 1997-98, all all that comm brevity is is standard. The the uh, and then we talked about the hardware changes that we had. So I think that the training and readiness, and and the hardware that we had been given in naval aviation in, in those years were much much different than 1991. So Crunch, when I think of my first Fallon debt, it was 1985. Um, and Strike U was actually a little cinder block building. There was no NSOC or Nautic at that time. And I'll say all we did was tar cap, strike cap, bar cap. It was all air to air. There was no such thing as dropping bombs in the F-14. So that was very focused. We did do constant peg, my first um, Fallon debt, where we got to fight the MiGs. And I've documented that on the channel um, a couple episodes, including the one I just did with Heater. But it was this focus. So I remember that by the time I got to be a department head and most acutely by the time I was CAG ops, the planning details and the focus was completely different. Um, so what do you remember about your responsibilities as maybe not a strike lead, but part of a strike package going into Fallon during your first tour? So going into Fallon at this point, I was not a strike lead. I was a new flight lead. So two plane, uh, working on my division lead, I think, as I was in Fallon, maybe, maybe I just got it. Uh, I was working on my forward air controller airborne qualification. Uh, so my, my role was, I was one of those, those taskies, one of those doers. So the type of guy that hoser would walk in and be like, Hey, crunch, figure this out. Oh, okay. And now I go, I got a job and I go do the task. And I need it in five minutes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime you want to do it, it's fine. As long as it's in the next four and a half minutes, you're good. <laughs> it was easy in, in the sense that you're like, oh, I have one job. Go go do this. And at the same time, it was hard because if you didn't go out of your way, I found if I didn't go out of my way to figure out what was going on, it was easy to just kind of be like, yeah, I don't know. what What's a harm? You know, who's, who's doing what? Um, you know, t- tell me again about the, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, you know, it, it, it's easy to just not be fully up to speed on what everybody is doing when you're not the strike lead. You know, I was a strike lead later in life and I, I, I can see it from both sides. And I can tell you my, my situational awareness as a young JL was definitely lower than it was when I was more experienced, as you would expect. Uh, so I was the doer. I was the tasky. I was the guy who said, okay, I'm going to go weapon near this thing here. And I'd come back to somebody like Hoser and be like, okay, here's what I recommend for delivery. And he would either say yes or 
no, because we got to be at this altitude or something. You're like, all right, let me, let me go figure it out again. And then you would come back and do it again. That was, that was my experience. At the same time, we had, uh, uh, you were talking about how you were doing nothing but tar cap and things like that. We were doing a lot more, uh, is it, would it be right? It wouldn't be a self-escort strike, but we were doing a lot more of the air to ground mission in Fallon than Tomcat squadrons had just two, three Fallon debts ago, right? So a lot more of that. And with that came weaponeering, uh, as we're doing death by acronyms during this episode, JMEMS is, is something that we got smart on, which is a joint munitions. What's the I for manual? It, it was an E. Effectiveness. Oh, JMEMS. Yeah, JMEMS. And in reality, it was just, it was a computer program by the time we were using it. it, it there was a manual somewhere. And that was how you figured out, hey, we want to go through six feet of concrete. We need a fuse with a 0.8 second delay or whatever the case is. And bam, that, that would be incredibly long, probably. Right. All of this, let's just call it nuance. I know dropping bombs is a is not exactly an elegant business necessarily. But, uh, you know, as you said, fusing, which bomb is right for the job? Dimpies. You mentioned Dimpies, Hoser, which is where is the aim point? Do you want the building to fall over this way or, or sort of in, in the shadow of its, of its where it stands? Um, all of these things are things that you could execute, you could plan uh, based on the tasking. So we got smart. I'm talking particularly about Tomcat guys on that, that part of the war. And as you mentioned, Crunch, as a JO, you're kind of in the do your job you know, using a football team analogy here. I was blocking and tackling. That's all I was doing was, there's my assignment, hit that guy. Right. And so you would want some savvy of, okay, what's that harm shooter doing? What's the AW piece? Where's the tanker? That kind of things. But your job is hit this target on time, you know, in concert with everything else, right? So that's the, hey, right tackle, go this way and and open the hole at the, at the two two, you know, two spot or whatever in the B gap. Um, and so, whereas Hoser has to know, he's like the CEO of the strike. He's got to know everything about everything, which he's Tom Brady. He's, he's got to, Tom he's Brady. Be able to well, no, he's, he's, play. he's Belichick. He's the coach yeah. and also Brady. He's both Brady and Belichick to use a sort of dated um, Patriots analogy. <laughs> um, but oh in God. any case, the product would be this briefing packet. You know, and, and so when you got into what we would call the mass gaggle brief, which is everybody in the strike, upwards of 25 or 30 aviators would go to the mass gaggle brief, generally hosted in the strike leads ready room, and you would give them this packet. And, and sometimes it was a lot of pages. I don't want to say maybe 40, but, you know, you'd have this thing. This is pre-digital. You'd have this thing that you mini miniaturized and you stapled it and this is what your intel guys were doing for you and then you would as guys walk through the ready room door you go here's your packet and they would sit down and you'd, you'd highlight what you cared about but this was really a lot of work for starters and we learned from desert storm to desert fox how to do this more and more effectively you know desert storm uh was characterized by paper and so you know guys are you know are drawing uh, the the uh you know the, the formation on on a on a card and then then reproducing that. Uh, you had to fly the S three famously to the beach to get the air tasking order, which is what you're going to do the next day. And, had, and that, that was hundreds of pages. You have to go through it and find what what you have to do. Um, a lot of work. But in 1998, it was digital, and we had a digital kneeboard card with everyone's everyone's call sign on it. You know, we we got that information, all the side numbers, and uh, here's the route of flight. Here's the imagery. So you have all that on a kneeboard. And I, I would have said 10 to 12 pages typically uh, for the strikes that we flew. And uh, but yes, you're, the, the mass gaggle brief in, in a ready room, uh, you know, we had a, a, a single seat ready room, ready three on Enterprise. So, you know, you sure to have, you know, 40 aviators in their standing room only guys are sitting cross legged on the floor, uh, you know, scribbling down more information. And then you would go into uh, an element brief, maybe the, the strikers for to eight airplanes, maybe. And then you go into your, your squadron brief. Okay, we're going to take off and, and join here. And when we come back from all this, we're going to rendezvous together and, and do this. Uh, so, so that whole process was uh, approaching two hours. And then, uh, and then you might get a, a, 
you know, Coke and a candy bar and, uh, and, and man up from there. So that was, uh, it was hours before we walked, we, we, we were, we had to brief this. And again, we had to plan 24 hours or more before that. So that big air tasking order coming to the ship, our portion of it, what time of day would you say that we would typically get that, Ozer? Oh, I, I can't remember. Late. We would we'd get the smooth version. We would get a rough idea earlier in the day, but the smooth one that we were actually able to schedule or plan off of wasn't until later in the day. And so it might be seven, eight o'clock at night before you get this document that says, well, here's our, here's our frequencies assigned. Here's our tanker. Here's the location of the tanker. Oh, wow. That's going to change some things. Oh, here's the tanker frequency. Ah, we just changed two, uh, you know, targets or whatever the case is. So that then the next day as you're going through, you know, you, you, you don't have, it, you talk about 24 hours. Well, somewhere in there, you want to sleep, you want to eat, and you might have to fly something else too. There was a lot to do between the time you received that and you launched. And, uh, it was, you know, if you as the strike lead had to pass that around and it wasn't like we were, it wasn't like airing felon where that's all you had to do. You had a lot more things pulling you in other directions. And I, I just offered that. I remember that you would go into civic, uh, carrier Intel center right there at the, uh, in the center where all the Intel folks are, and you go in there and do some planning. You'd have people from different strike groups and Intel all over the place. And then somebody would be like, Hey, I gotta go. I gotta come back. And, and it was just, I don't want to use the word chaos, but it was controlled. It was controlled, but it was hectic. It was hectic. And there, I, for me, I know that for me, you'd sit there and you'd be like, I got an hour and a half and I've got three hours of work left. This is, th something's got to give. And then you got to figure out where the priorities are. Well, I know I need, I know I need gas. Let's figure that out. All right, let's move forward. You know, that was, that was the, 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 the just for the listeners, the impression, the, uh, I would like to leave the impression of, uh, you know, like you said, controlled chaos is maybe overstating it, but it was definitely not uh, easy. Yeah. And there's anxiety, right? That there, sure. this is what you learn. This is what they try to impose during Fallon is this, you know, strike lead, you have responsibility. They, there's a lot of entropy over the course of planning to take off. They want to put you through the ringer. They want you to feel that everything's last minute because inevitably it's going to have this this these changes from the ATO as written last minute mm -hmm. kind of thing. Let me ask specifically, because we've talked sort of in the abstract about what we learned at Fallon and so forth, but specifically, because you guys mentioned you had three weeks from InChop to Fifth Fleet until you, you launched for Desert Fox. So what did you do during those three weeks specifically that wound up being the operation? So Hoser, you've already mentioned that you had some pass down from Pat Rainey, um, but specifically using all the things we're talking about, what did you do for those three weeks that got you ready for day of? We had planned some 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 strikes uh, for for this contingency. You know, we knew that I could. They they were on the cat and then then stood down. So so yes, we we got the work they did. But then we also had uh, some others that uh, that we knew, we knew that we were going to go into uh, and. And this, you know, what, what became Desert Fox initially, okay, if this is an all Navy and Marine Corps show, then, uh, you know, what, what's, what's that first night going to be? So we, we studied that and, and, and planned that and just kind of kept that in our back pocket. I'll say that, uh, uh, I don't know, about a week or so, I remember, um, before Desert Fox, uh, Admiral Willie Moore came out to the ship, and maybe it was a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, he visited all the ready rooms. He came in my ready room and I, I said, welcome home, Admiral. You know, he's a, a VFA background kind of guy. And he, he, he got what I meant. Um, but uh, he just kind of giving us a big picture. Hey, we need you guys to be ready. You know, the, the typical, you know, three-star visit. Um, but so what the, was his job? Was he fifth fleet? He sixth fleet? fleet. I'm sorry. Fifth yes. Fleet. And I, th I think I, I may have been in on a, on a, on a CO's meeting, you know, with, with Admiral Moore and the cat and the captain. And uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a sense of urgency. Uh, about four days before Desert Fox kicked off, uh, CAG Tom Hagen, you know, without a sense of urgency, it says, "Yo, guys, just just keep keep working on your folders." And then two days before, it was, uh, "Hey, th this this thing might go." And then and then I think it was uh, probably uh, probably thirty six hours before. Okay, th this is going to go. And uh, so the on the morning of December sixteenth, um, I, I knew this was happening. But, uh, you know, the captain got on the 1MC 
and said, all right, we're going to go into this op. And, uh, you know, we were in the ready room when this was going on. And, uh, you know, I was prepared for it, obviously, and said, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, we, we had a we had our, our all officers meeting about how we're going to conduct ourselves over the next uh, four nights. But um, uh, many of my JOs were, were surprised. Wow. I had, had, had no idea. You know, now, you know, some of my lieutenants had been working with me on my strike plan. and all, But that was just to kind of, you know, keep in, in, in the back pocket. We've talked about the ATO. ATO is the how the flight schedule is going to be written for the next 24 hours, generated by the Joint Forces Air Component Commander in Riyadh. But they also determined what everybody's targets were going to be. So you mentioned you had some pass down from Ike. Was that CAG-7 aboard Ike um, yes. at that time? Okay, yeah. so you got their pass down. But then you get like maybe the targets you're going to get for any given strike was the same or different, but then they were established. And then 24 hours out, the ATO was written against the established targets. And as Crunch was saying, this is your tanker plan, frequencies, all the other specifics against the targets that you already, let's just say, knew you were going to hit. And and so on night one of Desert Fox, it was just us on Enterprise. And so that's that precluded the the, the ponderous ATO and, and all the all the all of that um, you know big wing tanking and other airplanes uh, to so they wouldn't have that as a tipper. Okay, here we come. So so we had that going for us that uh, you know obviously higher authority knew what we were going to do. We told them what we were going to do. They didn't tell us on on the subsequent nights there was an ATO and this is when we broke out. Uh, the strikes that the guys on Ike had had given us and, and and flew them, so that that's how night one worked. It was it was just us, and uh, and the first strike I recall, and, and Crunch was on the strike. It uh, it launched uh, just before midnight. All all the strikes in Desert Fox were night. So let's let's pull up to thirty thousand feet just for a segue here. The strike that Ike was going to do was was halted at the very end because of the international reaction to the notion. And there's some cynical belief that the reason that President Clinton said go when you guys did it is sort of a, let's call it a wag the dog scenario uh, because of the Monica Lewinsky scandal and some other things that were going on around his impeachment. Um, Was there any level of awareness or discussion around that element uh, about the time that you guys were about to execute Desert Fox? That was never discussed. It wasn't even a thought. Now, now later in the operation, it came to my attention, but uh, it, in, in the, the ramp up, no, for me. I was equally blissfully unaware of the drama going on inside the Beltway at the time, to the point that I saw something on the TV about, hey, impeachment hearing for Clinton. And I would watch it and look at it. And all I would say is, that's a bad idea and move on. <laughs> that was that was the essence. Uh, that was in... I didn't know the story. I didn't. Well, that's not true. I knew what was going on, but uh, we we just kind of nose down, keep going because we've got a job to do, and tried not to pay attention to what was going on because it didn't affect us in reality. So, so let's talk. As Hoser said, this the the day one of what turned out to be a four day um, war uh, was a Navy only, which is to say Navy and Marine Corps, because there was a Marine Corps squadron in the air wing, um, and and so it was a carrier based only op on on day day 1. So talk to us about the conduct of this day. Hoser, why don't you talk about what was going on in in 105? We had a squadron reenlistment uh, at at dawn on the morning of uh, of the 16th up in the, up in the flag bridge Admiral Dawson was there. And then after that I, I, again I knew that this was happening. Uh, we went down to the ready room, the, the captain talked to the ship on the 1MC and then I went right into to, to my discussion. Basically, I told the guys, you know, we have been through all of the foul stuff, all the workups, all of you guys, even you nuggets have got about a hundred carrier landings under your belt. And that is quite a bit of carrier landing experience. And so you guys are on the step. Our newest pilot was uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Eric Rasmussen, our safety officer, who had a Desert Storm veteran. Our, uh, our, our new XO, Mike Shoemaker, had been in the squadron a couple of months, made the last workup with us. Again, an experienced aviator. And, and everyone else has is, is, is got quite a bit of, of training and readiness. Uh, so, so, so we were ready. So Mike, Mike Shoemaker, later the air boss, also a classmate of mine, 
Always important to mention that. Um, and uh, so quite an all-star team that, that you have there. It really, really was. So, uh, you know, so we're, we're doing the last minute stuff. I, I, maybe I got a cat nap there. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, we briefed my strike. I flew or led the last of four strikes that evening. Uh, as I recall, there was a flight skit. There was an airplane for that day. Uh, you know, just a standard airplane where it all of a sudden became, Hey, we're doing this. Cancel the airplane. Cause we got to shift everybody to a night page, like full night. Cause normally we'd be finishing at 2300 and now we were starting. And so we had all the people working the flight deck, the yellow shirts, blue shirts, maintenance, everybody's gearing up, loading up airplanes, getting ready for it for the evening event. We, um, we had another level in VF 32 going on because we had, um, you know, all the FAC A mission. And so we had to be ready with the, basically the C to run the CSAR package in the event that somebody went and got shot down. And in, from our point of view, we thought that that was a very real possibility that somebody was going to get shot down, crash, whatever, not come back. And we were have to get going to go get them. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to overstate it. It was just like, this is possibly a likely scenario. So let's, so we were, we had to be ready for it. And so in addition to planning for the evening strikes, we had several of us uh, planning for the uh, CSAR package, the combat search and rescue, the rescue mission commander thing, which is done in conjunction with, uh, you have an E2 go in where they'll have an overall picture mission commander. And then the, the two seat Tomcat goes in as the RMC and we're going to be driving the show and you'll have Hornets going in, keeping, uh, you know, basically to shoot down the bad guys, uh, drop bombs on bad guys. And then the helicopters going in low to recover folks. So we had to put, a strike package together for that, which, I mean, we kind of, as I recall, we dusted one off and changed the names and said, okay, we're, we're ready to go. And so then I was on, uh, as I mentioned, so Jim McCall and I, call sign mouth, were on the first airplane off cat one that night, first airplane off the ship and boom, I was a little cynical. So here we, we actually manned up the airplane and I'm in there. We taxi on the cat one and I go, nope they're going to scrub this thing. You watch. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden they put us in tension. I go, holy cow, we're really going. All right. Boom. And so off we go, we get airborne, boom, do our thing, go on our mission. And then through the rest of the night, Hoser, you said you were like event three or four. If I'm not mistaken, by then things were running late. If I remember correct. Yeah. Yes, they were. And it was delayed and delayed to the point that when I was, when I landed after my, my first mission, Jim and I got got our kneeboard cards for our RMC mission for our CSAR and said, okay, now we're ready. And we stood the alert 15 in the ready room in all our gear, right? Never got never changed clothes. But like now we're ready to go to go launch on the CSAR. And we were supposed to be done at like four or five. And it just kept going because the strikes were were a little delayed. And it was like we we saw the sunrise still sitting at alert 15 CSAR just in case. What kind of weapons were you carrying and what was your target we were carrying gbu 24s uh bravo bravo i believe was the the gbu 24 and that's the bunker buster it's a huge yeah. bomb this thing is gigantic and so we had gbu 24s going in to hit uh weapons bunkers so a bunker buster against a bunker makes sense and you mentioned csar and the threat Obviously, over the course of, of Southern Watch, years and years, all the CAD we did, all of the other, you know, pop-up SAM harm shooting we did over the years, onesies and twosies, their strategic SAM threat was somewhat neutralized. However, there were mobile SAMs, there were other things that we were afraid of. Um, specifically, what what did you think would be the, the main threat as far as SAMs? We were going in mid-altitude, so, you know, SA six and three were the more percentage threats. And we thought that those were going to be a problem. I'll say that when we went in, you know, Hoser, you mentioned it. We announced we were coming. We said, by the way, we're coming and we're coming at midnight. And boom, we, we went in and Iraq turned the lights off and just started shooting in the sky. So we're going in in goggles and you could see off on the horizon. It was just the triple a was just arcing up all the tracers. It was just all up there. And you're like, all right, that's reaching my altitude. That is above my altitude. And so we went in, did our mission. They were shooting all sorts of stuff at us. We thought it was going to be 
targeted and that the harm guys were going to be going after it, but they turned off their, their, uh, their targeting radars, I guess, because of the harm threat. And we're just hoping for a lucky shot. So the other thing to, before you guys launched, there were a bunch, I don't know the exact number of T-Lambs, Tomahawks that were shot from everything from submarines to small boys to whatever, right? That's part of any contingency operation is what we call an integrated air defense rollback. And then part of your strike package, both Crunch and Hoser was attached like EA-6Bs and harm shooters, dedicated harm shooters, that in the event of a pop-up threat, you could soft kill it with jamming, and then if need be, hard kill it with a with a with a harm missile. Um, so that's part of anything that you were prepared to do in the event that you got your raw gear lit up, kind of a thing. Um, and so that that's all baked into the way we did business. Again, as Hoser was pointing out, we got really sophisticated about how we did this from Desert Storm until Desert Fox, um, and how we do it now is the orders of magnitude even even more sophisticated. Um, so did you hit your target crunch and did you have the, the footage that you sh- were able to look at it in civic? I did not hit my target, <laughs> but everybody else did. I was like the one miss. What happened? Did, did wrong, wrong aim point. The, did, the, the lantern the didn't come off. Lantern, the lantern went screwy and, uh, during bomb work. time of fall, it went screwy. Yeah. It, oh, okay. uh, some, sometime in there, it, it, it went, went nutty and. Dead eye, just like in Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Here's the thing, though: everybody else hit their target. Zero two hundred. I'm in ready three, and I'm I'm briefing uh, my guys for the last strike. And so, so everyone's in the ready room and standing room only, and guys are cross legged on the floor, and 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 they're listening to me brief them. And and there's a way to brief, and and it's yeah. You know, I was I was feeling it in the moment. I mean, okay, you know, we're going to go on a combat hop, and I'm the strike lead, and, and all these guys are watching me. And, and if, uh, I, I got to know my stuff. And of course I, I did, but I've got to convey it with confidence, you know, for, for these guys to follow me. But during the middle of that brief, the phone rings and, and it's either the air boss or air ops or maybe CAG ops. And, and, and they had to talk to me right then. So I interrupt the brief and I take the call and I say, hey, look, the, the recovery is late. Can you slide 30 minutes? And I say, no, I can't. I can't because, you know, we're on goggles and the sun's going to come up and we know when the sun's coming up. You know, we had a discussion about, you know, nautical twilight and astronomical twilight. And, you know, you, you know those things when you're a goggle pilot. And uh, so, so I can't do it. Now, normally, you know, you get a call like that and already, OK, this is the way it is and live with it. But I, I said no. So we, you know, compromise. OK, 15 minutes. So we, we had to slide 15 minutes. And even that 15 minutes affected us uh, in the end game over the target. So you were the fourth event. Each of the so-called pointy nose squadron COs led. And uh, and I was I was uh, the the most junior of the four, and and uh, I had the last one. So talk to us about your event. It was a uh, um, a uh, let's see a, a control building and a storage facility. Uh, we uh, we went in uh, mixed division, so we had uh, uh, a couple three Tomcats with us. Uh, I had a, a squadron wingman, and then another division of Hornets. We're going to roll in with iron bombs on a uh, on an SA three site, and and so our what we wanted to do was just you know have a shotgun blast on this uh, on this uh, surface air missile site. Now, before we uh, briefed, uh, we got the intel back from the first strike that Crunch was on that this SAM site had been taken out, and so we we got some more intel on that. We launched, I think it was a four forty five launch. And we had uh, 45 minutes was our was our TOT. Again, it was just us. And so we were late. We, we got together over the ship in Carrier Box 4. We were late. And we had a route over Kuwait that we had to fly. You got to fly this route, you know. And uh, I just cut off a leg. You know, we're behind. And, you know, sorry, they'll, they'll, they'll get over it. Uh, so we uh, into the target area, um, deliver our weapons. Uh, again, we in the, in the Hornets are carrying GBU-16s. And these are 1,000-pound. Uh, Goms, so a, uh, a thousand pound bomb with a uh, LGB kit. So you got the secret head on those. You got the fins on the back. These things take hours to build down in the in the, the magazines. You know the Ordies are had been working all day to build those things and, and did quite quite an effort. You know these are weapons that we are not used to carrying, actually, and we we dropped quite a bit of them. So anyway, the F-14s have their target. We have ours. Uh, the Hornet division is rolling in there. Coming off target, 
I looked down and I saw winking on the ground and I knew right away that was small arms. There, there was, I wasn't afraid of, of triple a certainly, uh, you know, for that strike there, there was, there was nothing, you know, near our altitude. And, and we, we were so close to the Kuwaiti border. I mean, you just kind of roll out of your Angola bank and, and you're back in Kuwait. Um, the sun was coming up and we, uh, so took the goggles off course and, uh, we had a, a, a day trap that the deck was ready for us. Cause that was it. That was the, the last thing. Post-strike, you know, the first place you go is to Siddick and you, you look at the tapes and Admiral Dawson was there and, uh, you know, he had been up all night and I'm sure he's talking to all the aviators when they're coming back. So he was there and, and, and saw what we had done. And, and he pulled me aside and said, Hey, Kevin, I'm going to allow you to call home. I want you to go with my, with my officer here and go into flag spaces, talk to your wife, tell her that you're okay. And you know, we're, we're not done, but, but everyone's okay. And so, uh, wow, thank you, sir. And, uh, I was able to do that and, and, and talk to her, you know, with, uh, what was it? The, the eight hour time difference. And, uh, uh, she said that that was so important. She passed the word to the others and, uh, um, and slept soundly. So what a, what a great piece of leadership by Admiral Dawson. So did you hit your target? Did the BDA show that you had hit your target? Uh, my wingman did in, in, in my cockpit. I was, I was unsure of the symbology. And so okay. I didn't drop. And this is, you know, you, you talk about things like this, you know, if it's, if it's not suitcased, you're not going to drop. It's not worth it. On night two, I let a strike, uh, uh, well up into uh, Iraq, and, and this strike had uh, big wing tanking. I mean, you know, they they knew we were coming and all that. We uh, we hit our target, and and this was a uh, uh, another one of those mixed divisions. So uh, there's uh, three Hornets and, and two F-14s in, in my formation. We hit our target, but we had one of my F-18s uh, flown by Eric Rasmussen. Uh, he was going to save his weapons for a, a couple of targets for us to hit on the way home. So, so after we pulled off, we are now uh, heading toward, toward his target. And on the way there, his, his FLIR goes down. And that means his, his laser targeting capability is, is gone. And uh, so we talked about this. All right, this is a contingency. This is going to be uh, what we call buddy bombing. So, uh, so I'm now going to laze for Hitch. And he'll drop his, his bomb my laser is going to pick it up and guide it into the target. So we're about, uh, about 30 miles away coming in to the area. Uh, th- this target is a, uh, is a communications target and it's, it's right in the middle of a, uh, of a, a city, uh, very critical that, that you hit it and nothing else. Uh, I am now going to use the training aids as we, uh, as we, uh, recount what happened here. So, so, so here's me and I'm flying tack wing, on on hitch and as we're coming into the target area i'd say we're almost a, a minute from release he takes a, a cut away from me I'm like okay so i kind of follow him and then he starts coming back into me so i'm, I'm matching him just to stay here in tack wing and he's coming in and coming in and so i see this and i overbank i'll just pull about 20 degrees and then as i rolled out I'm looking over my leading edge extension and there's an FA-18 right there. And I just picked it up and just kept it going. We probably missed by a plane length. Uh, I got on the radio, abort, 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 abort. And uh, so, okay, we skip it. And, uh, you know, master arm safe and, and, and continued on with the mission. We uh, came, came back to the ship and, uh, and, and found that, that, uh, that he wanted to line his airplane up uh, for, to give the, the weapon a, a better angle on the target. And then uh, he also wanted to roll in on the target, dive on it, and then pick it up through his his uh, his HUD, his system, uh, to to allow him to to, to better release it. Um, so this is you know the, the, these types of things happen. You have contingencies. You know we we obviously you, you don't want to drop in that situation. It'd be a black eye if uh, if that bomb was was errant on night three. I was a uh, uh, I was a harm shooter. I scheduled myself to lead a uh, a harm element, so I'm, I'm I'm with a wingman, and this was a, a strike that had B1s in it. And I, I'm not sure if the if the B1s flew on night two, but uh, they were with us on this night. Uh, the call sign Slam Zero Three, so they're in formation with us, and we're also in formation with a uh, uh, F16 uh, section and uh, GR1 tornadoes in our formation. So the tornado guys checked in and with his 
deep, deep Scottish brogue. He probably transmitted for 30 seconds. I, I couldn't hardly understand a word of it. I just said, Roger, and, and on we went. But, but uh, on night three, I'm shooting my harm, and I'm on timeline, launch the harm, and it comes off, and I'm on goggles, and it's just like a sun that is moving away from my airplane. It's completely washing out my goggles. I, I, I essentially can't see. I turn 30 degrees away from my next shot, shoot it, another sun, you know, can't see a thing, and now I've lost track of my, of my wingman, although I am the lead. He's got to fly on me. And, uh, but also during this time, the, those B1s, and I, I wanted to see their hits. So I had my FLIR now, I designated it to their target, and, and I'm watching on, on my display, and it's just like the Schweinfurt raid. I mean, it's just the stick of 100 bombs. That, that's all they had. They did not have a precision capability in the airplane at the time, so they just dropped an unguided stick of, of uh, you know dozens of bombs and, and hit the target. We went back to the ship, and we are now low on fuel. And so this is, uh, you, you, you check back with the E2, and uh, okay, there's only one KC-10, and it's only got 25,000 pounds of fuel left. Oh my gosh! So there's, uh, you know, there was uh, seven or nine of us that, that need gas, and uh, we're, you know we're not going to get anything that, that we need, but we need something. So uh, so we're on the KC-10's wing. We're on bearing line. There's a couple airplanes, maybe three airplanes ahead of me, and I've got a wingman with me, and we're probably down to 5,000 pounds, and. From high to low, two hornets, you know, come into my field of view, and and that is a big no-no. So I, I won't name the squadron, but uh, and so now those guys are ahead of us, and and we're like like you know number six or seven for the bar, and I just pulled away. Okay, look, we we need fuel. I know that another KC-10 is coming up from Al Dafra. It's 150 miles away, so I start heading toward it. I'll be the first one there. I check in with the ship. The ship says check in with uh, with Marshall. And or departure and departure now grabs me. So, and I said, look, I can see the KC-10. I, I'm going for it. And they say, no, you're going to go to an S3. Fine. So we each get 2,000 pounds. And we were so low on fuel that I took 1,000 pounds, got out so my wingman, round boy, could get in and get 2,000 because he was really low on fuel. And I went back in to get my 1,000. We're still low on fuel because they sent us to Marshall and we're going to have a push time in 40 minutes. It's not going to work. So we started heading to the KC-10 again, and, and they said, wrong, come back. They launched an S-3, and we each got a couple thousand pounds and, and you know, happy ending. But the S-3, the, the VS-22 Vidars did outstanding work. That night, they pulled the SDO off the desk and, and, and man up, you know, you're, you're flying the alert. They launched everything they had, and they gave away every drop of fuel they had on our event and the one after. So none of us had to go to the beach or certainly flame out. I mean, just, just uh, amazing work. And just to mention a couple of details based on what you, you the, the stories you just said is there was a RAF component to Desert Fox. Uh, the, the Brits were involved, um, not on night one, but after that, you mentioned the tornadoes. And Tony Blair, Prime Minister Blair, was a partner to President Clinton in the, in the sort of impetus behind doing this against Saddam. The other thing you point out is the sort of Semper Gumby part of carrier aviation, where the tanker plan will not go as briefed. And you did some good head work there to audible between options. And also the ship gets a vote with what your options going to be, obviously. And, and so you just take what they get. 2,000 pounds is not a whole lot of gas, especially if you think it's going to be case three. So every look at the deck is 1,000 pounds. Case one, it's 800 pounds to go around the pattern. So, you know, you're like, oh, 2,000 pounds, that sounds like a lot. That's not a lot. Um, and so gas is the most important equation. Plus, as you commented, and I'm sure we all feel the same way, whether it's OSW or Desert Fox, the scariest part of these missions is the tanking, especially when you're doing double and triple cycle missions. And I've talked about the midair that we had in the pattern during OSW when Admiral Mullen was the strike group commander and I was CAG ops, the Marine squadron had a midair killed the XO. That's the most dangerous and the most stressful part of these missions in general. So that's another thing when you think about carrier aviation, the skill involved and the focus Got to keep that in mind. And your story just bears that out. In each of our strikes, uh, the, the, 
you know, we got the last minute tasking, just like you get a Fallon, it, it, it upsets you, it bothers you. You know, why are they doing this to me? It happened every time. And, and you got to deal with it, obviously. And, uh, and, and we did. And, and we flew outstanding formations in the combat area. And our comm was professional and, and crisp. So, you know, you, you go back to your training. And, you know, mistakes were made, sure. Uh, but do you go back to your training and, and you are going to fly at that level and uh, the level of training is superb and it reflected it in our performance. Also, in your squadron, you had the first female aviators that did combat ops. How did that go? Enterprise was uh, the only carrier, carrier air wing that was integrated with women on the East Coast. Uh, in, uh, on the West Coast, I think it was uh, Air Wing 11. Uh, in Lincoln, I, I believe, but uh, but that was it at the time. So roughly fifteen percent of of our squadrons were integrated with women, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Kendra Williams in VFA one hundred and five was the only female pilot that we had. Some other squadrons had had two or three. Yukon uh, flew on that uh, first strike on, on the first night, and uh, and her target was was at SA three. The SA three had been moved into a tree line, and using her flare, she found that. And was able to put her uh, GBU on on that target on the tree line. This is an outstanding job. Now, uh, so she gets back to the ship, and within hours, you know, the word is out that that uh, you know the first female, uh, you know, tactical aviator or combat aviator, expended weapons in combat. On the second day, the press descended on Enterprise and descended on on Yukon. They all want to talk to her. USA Today, People Magazine sent someone out to enterprise to, to interview her. And, uh, and she carried herself with professionalism. I could not have been happier with how uh, she, she answered their questions. She, she's a humble aviator doing her job, happens to be a woman, happy to be here and uh, very, very well done. So a super pilot and, and, a, and a, great, uh, a great message for our country. The other thing, first time the B-1 was used in anger out of Diego Garcia, uh, so this is an airplane that was designed to go in low against the Soviet Union and morphed into first a dumb bomber and then kind of a semi-smart bomber that was used extensively for close air support of all missions in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So when the dust settled after day four, how did the air wing feel? Mission accomplished. Air wing three had about a 70 to 80 percent hit rate. And this is just unprecedented. I mean, in uh, 1991 for naval aviation, the majority of deliveries were, were iron bombs and delivered very well by, by capable aircraft and pilots, but you just can't get numbers like that. But uh, uh, we had had numbers like that because of the precision weapons that we're all using. I mean, it, it, uh, after the first night, it was pretty much laser guided precision on everything. And uh, you, you get numbers like that and uh, okay, that, that's that's the new expectation now, and uh, and and this was about a year before JSAL and JDAM came out, which are also game changers. And uh, dropping those laser laser guided bombs, you had to guide them, and had to, so we're, we're on goggles in formation. We're looking at our screens, you know, guiding these weapons, you know, all all the way to, to impact. Another change was the fact that uh, digitally and and with with Challenge Athena, I can talk to a uh, F sixteen guy on the beach about his uh, formation. And I'll, I'll tell him what we're going to do for him regarding the uh, suppression of enemy air defenses. And, uh, and all that coordination is, is terrific. And then other than looking at, at a message and you got to figure out what's important in this message and you have no way to, to ask questions about it. So th- th- that is another game changer. So Crunch, I remember the EXO's email summarizing the event was circulated widely. I was teaching at the Naval Academy and, and got that. And you're telling uh, it, uh, yes, right. I remember yeah. the one. Uh, and, and so he, he got some, anecdotally, I heard he got some grief for that level of detail, borderline classified at the time. Um, but it really did demonstrate how far the Tomcat community had come. And so I think if I'm hearing you right, this went from being a novelty to being something that was fundamental to the F-14. Absolutely. So fast forward to the final Tomcat deployment in uh, 05, 06. Uh, I was the maintenance officer for VF-213. We no longer had AIM-54. 
right? I don't know if you all remember that, but we actually divested of the active missile component on the F-14 at the end. We're like, holy cow, we were AIM-9 and AIM-7 only uh, on F-14Ds because our we were now at the point where we're like, you know what? That's expensive. You guys can go bomb, go do it. And that's what we did. You know, we, we had we weren't going out doing air superiority with an AIM-9 and AIM-7 mic, right? That it that suddenly became the Hornet mission and we're out there bombing. So it, it, I, the F-14 mission like flip-flopped 180 degrees from where it was, was originally back in the 70s and 80s to all of a sudden it's a precision bomber. The irony of retiring the F-14 it w- is it was more lethal than it had ever been in its history at the very end, including digital flight control systems. So flat spins were not an issue anymore, easier to land at the boat. You've mentioned Rover and all these other mission areas, Ford Air Controller Airborne, that we had a CNO approved syllabus that we were doing those sorts of things. What you guys did on Desert Fox and VF-32 is a manifestation of this capability over the years. So bravo Mm -hmm. Zulu for the swordsman for that execution. Crunch. Ann Hoser, thanks very much. Entreat the audience to check out Crunch and the Tomcast. As I always say when Hoser's on, you got to check out his books, Raven One Series and The Silver Waterfall. Hoser, we look forward to having you on the channel very soon. So thanks, you guys, for bringing your experiences from Desert Fox to us today. Thanks, Mooch. Great to be with you. Thanks, Mooch. Appreciate the, appreciate the invitation. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the Super Thanks the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.